So I don't know whether it's morning or afternoon where you guys are, but welcome to um, this family track session. I'm Pat Awesome. I will be moderating the panel today and I'm with Partnership uh, to End Addiction and delighted to have with me Molly Bobek, Ken Carpenter, Lorraine McNeil Popper, and Patty Sixtus as my panelists. Um, before we jump into it, I wanted to say, first of all, a big hearty thank you to Ryan Hampton and the Mobilized Recovery Organization for having us. We are just delighted to be here and to be able to talk to you about how to support families. Um, and I'm also gonna turn my screen on just for a moment, quick little infomercial about what um, our organization does, because I'm guessing that some of you probably um, are not familiar with Partnership to End Addiction. Um, so let me just get there, or maybe not, let's see. There we go. Um, so Partnership to End Addiction um, was the result of a merger in 2019 between Center on Addiction and Partnership for Drug Free Kids. Center on Addiction does amazing work in the area of uh, research and policy. And Partnership for Drug Free Kids, you might know, many of you might know from the uh, many of the commercials we've done over the years, um, including the one with the egg frying in the, the pan. It was like, this is your brain on drugs. Um, but our, our goal as we merged was to really look at how do we transform the way our uh, country addresses addiction. And we changed the name to reflect that. So going forward, you won't see either of the other two names, but you'll see Partnership to End Addiction. And our goal is really to lift up families so that no matter where they are on the journey, they get the help they need. So if you know that your family has a history of substance use and you're worried about how your uh, teen or young adult is going to um, engage with substances, there's, there's um, support for you all the way through, you know, perhaps you've got a daughter who's pregnant using heroin and you wanna know what do I do to support her? or somebody in recovery and wanting to know how to best support your loved one in recovery. We also are trying to advance effective care by making sure that it's based on the latest science. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there and our goal is to make sure that not only are families equipped with the right information, but providers um, as well. And then of course, public policies to, to really help provide funding um, for evidence-based care and treatment along the continuum and including families in the equation. Um, and last but certainly not least is to really change the culture by raising the voices and stories of families um, so that there's greater compassion and, and that, we, that we lose the stigma associated with this. So um, I know you've probably heard numbers earlier in, in other sessions. I just wanted to call your attention to the 70,000 number um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that we know as a result of the pandemic that that number is likely understated. It was actually 72,000 in 2019 and there, by every estimate, that number is understated for, for 2020 because of the pandemic. But even more so, um, the CDC just released a report not too long ago about alcohol-related deaths that occur every year and that number is closer to 90,000. So, you know, if you combine the two, you've got over 160,000 people that we are losing every year to this, this disease. It would be like, you know, I live in New Jersey, it's like filling MetLife Stadium where the Giants play to the bleed, you know, to the, to the rafters twice and then losing everybody that, that came to those games. Um, so that's why we want everyone at the conference to not only celebrate recovery, but help us help others. Um, and, and, and especially with a focus um, in our line of work on, on family support. So in just last slide here is to tell you a little bit about what our organization is doing. Um, we have a helpline that's bilingual. Um, the services are free that are offered by the helpline specialists. And they really will listen to families and hear their stories and try to provide um, help with developing a plan and guidance and resources so that they know how to respond in, 
to help their loved one and or themselves. So in 2019, we actually helped over 10,000 families and are looking to increase that number substantially. Um, we are working a great deal in the area of advocacy. And so far, um, we have advocates in almost all states. I think uh, Wyoming is where we're missing somebody. So if anybody out there is in Wyoming and wants to be a parent advocate, please, please let us know. Um, our website is drugfree.org. And there are tons of resources there, whether it's about um, vaping, parenting skills, um, uh, use of naloxone, um, medications to assist treatment, all kinds of information that's really great and has been vetted by experts in the field. Um, the uncovering gaps too was really addressing the parity issues related to ensuring that someone who has a mental health and or substance use issue is getting the same kind of um, support and treatment from insurance that someone with a physical problem would have. We had a Facebook campaign um, last year where we joined forces with Facebook for an SOS campaign that was Stop Opioid Silence, um, reaching more than 40 million people, really trying to lift up stories about people who are in recovery from opioid use disorder. And last but not least, we are really excited about a family support services um, for the Addiction Act, which is um, being sponsored in uh, uh, Congress at this point really trying to provide funding for families um, so that we can ensure that they're part of the solution um, in terms of helping um, end addiction in America. So with that, I want to stop sharing <laughs> and um, I would like each of our panelists to introduce themselves. So I'm going to um, go across my screen. Um, Patty Sixtus, I show you up first. Oh, all right. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. So, um, well, being the first one, I'll set the tone for this intro. Um, so, first of all, just grateful to be here and be here with all of you that have signed into this uh, session today. And a big thank you to Mobilize Recovery. This is my first time being involved with this, and it's been incredible so far. I'm learning all sorts of new information um, and really appreciate everything that I've I've seen so far. I'm here today as a voice for families impacted by addiction. I'm the mother of a son in long-term recovery. Um, I live in Huntsville, Alabama. And as a result of his recovery, um, I've had the privilege of becoming an ally, a recovery ally and, a, and an advocate. Um, I'm the co-founder of Not One More Alabama, which is a nonprofit here in Alabama. We provide hope, education, support to people who have been impacted by addiction. Um, I'm also very involved with the University of Alabama's Collegiate Recovery Community and Intervention Services, uh, a program that my son is a graduate of. Um, and most importantly today, I'm a parent coach with the partnership for, um, well, the partnership to end addiction. Uh, I was trained back in 2014 and have been coaching now for a number of years. And uh, it's an incredible experience. I've learned so much and I'm excited to be here today to, to share some of that with you guys. Thanks so much, Patty. Um, and perhaps um, you and, and Lorraine can explain a little bit more about the parent coaching program as we go through the, the panel discussion. Molly, you're up to bat. Hi, good morning slash good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Molly Bobeck. I'm very fortunate to work with Pat at Partnership to End Addiction. I come from Legacy Center on Addiction which is also legacy on National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse, which is also legacy National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University. In case any of our former names resonate with, with any of you, that's, that's the org that, that I've been lucky to be a part of for um, 12 years or so. I, I'm quite fortunate in the work that I do at the partnership to be on the research arm of things with a particular focus on disseminating and implementing family therapy for adolescent substance use. We have our own research that demonstrates the efficacy of family therapy for adolescent and young adult substance use, and it's our mission to make those evidence-based approaches of family therapy more accessible to providers and thus more available to families. Um, I'm fortunate also to 
have a synthesis in my work between working in this research arm. I also teach family therapy at a place called the Ackerman Institute in New York City. And I have a private practice where I work with couples and families where one or more members are struggling with substance use. Um, formerly based in Manhattan, now based in my bedroom. <laughs> uh, and so I'm, I'm happy to be here, as Patty said as well. Thanks a lot, Molly. I love, I love the bedroom comment, <laughs> aren't we all? Um, Ken Carpenter. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to stop in. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training and have been working in the field for about 25 years, um, wearing different hats, uh, primary uh, as a clinician, working with uh, individuals looking to make changes in their lives around substance use, um, as well as uh, having dipping into research and things like that. Um, the really cool thing I think about what I've been able to um, be part of for the last seven years is I'm affiliated with uh, CMC Foundation for Change, a not-for-profit in the city, New York City, and our collaborative efforts with uh, the partnership to kind of bring together um, a training program for parents who want to be uh, peer support, and Patty had mentioned this, and and Lorraine will to other parents. And that's been a real rewarding part of my work for the last seven years or so. So uh, thanks for stopping in. Thanks, Ken. And um, certainly last but not least is Lorraine. Hi, um, I'm Lorraine McNeil Popper and I'm really excited to be here um, and to be a part of this um, amazing event today. Um, I'm a professor of advertising and communication by trade and I'm also in the advertising industry. And that's what led me and connected me to the partnership. Um, I was approached to create PSAs to uh, the youth community. Um, there was a huge campaign for, uh, it was called Above the Influence. It was also done for, in, par in partnership with the partnership with um, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Now, during that whole journey, which lasted for, I would say, a year and a half with research and understanding and gathering insights, I never ever shared with the partnership about my family story. I never shared um, any information that I had lost my twin brother, adopted his son, and that my twin brother's son, who I consider my son, um, was in long-term recovery uh, at 14, went into a residential program. One day I shared that story and I was introduced to the most amazing community of families um, that shared the same experiences I did. And many of us later over time became part of, became parent coaches, trained in craft, um, worked on the hotline, shared our stories with other families, um, and it was a real healing process for me. I was, it was an advantageous on both sides. Um, and I was so grateful to have that opportunity and that connection. Um, I've been an advocate for decades, uh, testifying in front of Congress on the Hill, helping to pass policies and legislation that help to end the stigma around addiction and to provide the funding that we need for families. So um, thank you and I'm really excited to be. Thanks so much, Lorraine. Um, so like Lorraine, um, I, I ended up in a very similar situation um, with a loved one, my son, who um, also is in long-term recovery. But when uh, we initially engaged with the treatment system, I was basically told I was part of the problem um, and that um, what I really needed to do was detach from my, at that time he was 16 years old, and was struggling with ADHD and depression and then ultimately substance use. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of the, and, and I was not in this field at that time. And so I looked, you know, was listening to the experts um, at that time. Um, so I find that, the, you know, the title of this panel in terms of, you know, loving someone is, is um, obviously a very different approach than what I was initially introduced to. So, so Ken, I was wondering if you could kick us off and, and talk a little bit about, you know, what is that loving approach and, um, you know, is, is, and, and give us just a little bit of background on that for, for the um, participants. Uh, sure, Pat. Uh, thank you. Um, well, just a brief history. And I'm, I'm, 
it's probably a narrow version of history because I know there's so much out there. It's hard to get your mind over all the different avenues and paths um, and ways people try to help uh, families and individuals uh, struggling with substance use issues. Um, it, the particular perspective I'm going to talk about is uh, the idea of uh, the community reinforcement family training which really stemmed out of some of the ideas going back into the 80s where uh, families were reaching out uh, to treatment providers concerned about their loved ones um, and perhaps their level of motivation and concern was a little bit a couple steps ahead of where their loved one was at who might not necessarily be at a point where they were looking to make change and just the need of, well, what can be helpful to families um, who are trying to support their loved one, um, independent of, of their loved one's motivation. So those ideas uh, were kind of housed in this idea of um, unilateral family therapy. That's kind of the official title for it. But it was a way of just thinking about working with families um, independent of, of where their loved one was, even if their loved one was not interested in seeking treatment at that time. Um, and, and during the 80s um, and early 90s, there, there was a lot of thought put into that, ways to support loved ones um, in their own self-care, um, ways to talk about uh, strategies for them helping their loved ones, and, um, and ways to invite their loved ones into treatment. Um, and that all kind of trucked along, and the first time someone really tried to put out a big study on it, it was... Um, Bob Myers and his colleagues in 1999, who published a study on community reinforcement family training. And really the ultimate ingredients in that to what Pat was talking about was um, how to use positive reinforcement as a primary mechanism or primary driver for supporting loved ones. Um, often they were trying to think differently about all the punitive ways that people try to influence uh, loved ones and, and family members. And we're realizing that um, positive reinforcement can be a really, really useful way for approaching this. Um, so that idea of how to support, I always think about growing a garden in the sense that um, to grow a nice varied garden, um, you also have to water the flowers you want to support. Um, and if you're overly focused just on killing weeds, um, that might help address that, but um, the flowers that need nourishment also won't get the support they need. Um, so reinforcement is really giving permission and opening up um, to families how they think they can support the behaviors they want to see support and strengthen over time. Um, and take care of themselves as they do it. So um, that loving approach is really based on um, permission to use positive reinforcement in a way that can be of help. And that often resonates with people's connection to their loved one and, and being allowed to do that. So I'm wondering if um, either Patty or Lorraine would want to jump in with some of the tools that you're using or that you've used as parent coaches. Actually, it might be helpful to describe the parent coaching program first and then talk about the kinds of tools that um, Ken and his team have shared with us um, that we then use with families. So, Patty or Lorraine, you wanna jump in? Lorraine, you wanna start with talking about that and I'll jump in? Sure, um, you know, through CRAFT, I think some of the most important tools is, um, you know, motivational interviewing and communication, the communication skills that we learn. You know, addiction brings, can tear families apart. And through CRAFT, we were able to find the tools of communication and, and conversations to be able to bring and have a dialogue and bring families back together. You know, moto, um, validation, um, you know, letting an individual know, I hear you by repeating the question. Um, I hear what you're saying and this way, they know that they're listening. And all of these tools work, you know, 360, not just with the individual in recovery. Um, um, I really think the whole idea of just validating and, and bringing love into that, um, into that space and into that dialogue is critically important to constantly tell and affirm to your loved one in recovery that you love them. I mean, often they don't love themselves. Um, you know, think about the secrets that we have, harbor that we don't share with 
our friends and our neighbors and we hide things. That individual recovery is, has, is probably has a clutch, you know, tr um, trunks and, and, and uh, tons of, of secrets that they're hiding themselves and they're not holding and they're not sharing. So they're not loving themselves. So if we constantly tell them, you know, we love you, there's the affirmation of just every day validating something wonderful that they've done. Um, they feel guilty when they use, they feel guilty when they relapse. Um, letting them constantly know that there's something in their life today that they did that was meaningful. Um, there is something that they did um, that was that we love them for. We see the improvement, we're here for you. We might not think they're listening, but I've been told from families that I've coached, from my own families, you know what, I hear you. Um, and it was those times that stopped me from using, that um, you know, uh, stopped me from killing myself, um, that made me feel good about myself. So again, it's, it's those communication tools that just keep the family together, keep, bring us together as a community and to express our feelings without anger, without arguing, um, to create plans and strategies and um, keep the conversation going. Patty? Okay, so I'll, I'll pop in there. Let me just kind of go um, circle back a little bit to just what parent coaching is. Um, of course, it can take a lot of different roles, but what we're referring to is the parent coaching program through the Partnership to End Addiction. Um, and Lorraine and I are both in that program. Um, actually, I think Pat, you were trained back in the day too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so parent coaching is a program where when somebody is struggling, um, worried about their child, worrying about, you know, what's going on in their life, concerned, where it could be anywhere from a 14 year old who's maybe smoking pot and on the weekends to somebody who has a 30 year old who, you know, using IV heroin. I mean, it could be really any range of issues that might be going on with their loved one, um, they can call the helpline. And that helpline, they're going to be able to speak to either a clinician, um, if they're speaking to them on the phone, it'd be a clinician, they might be texting somebody that's a specialist in the field, um, texting or emailing, and be able to um, either get some answers um, for just an immediate issue that might be happening, not a crisis issue, but just something that's going on in their life. Um, and then through that conversation with that helpline specialist, they might determine that this person would benefit from some ongoing coaching. And so if they meet that criteria, then they can be referred to um, the parent coaching program. And that's where we come into that um, as coaches. And so when we get assigned somebody as a coach, um, we have a lot of say in who that, what, what that criteria might look like and who we would be comfortable with coaching. Um, and then we use um, the tools of craft to um, help coach these people over a five, uh, usually about a five week, once a week um, session with them. Um, and we just are there as a peer, as somebody who's been there um, to give them support, give them encouragement. Um, but, but on top of that, um, be able to give them some actual tools, hands-on tools. Um, we use something that's called the 20 minute guide. And I just love this tool. Um, it's a workbook, uh, it's available online for free, but I, I like to, to have my own hard copy because I'm old and I like to have a hard copy of that. Um, and, uh, but it's kind of just, it's just chock full of amazing tools that somebody can use. And when my son was going um, through, when, while he was in active addiction and struggling, um, I, I just, to have this kind of information really could have been game changing for us. Um, so tools, like one of the tools that I always use when I'm coaching, it's usually one of the first things I use with people is something we call behaviors make sense. Um, and it's really a great way to start a conversation with somebody because you're basically telling somebody that if their loved one is, has a behavior, then they're either being reinforced, which is going to make that behavior continue or not reinforced, which is going to hopefully um, make that behavior discontinue. And just a tool like that, um, having that, which is part of craft is a very important um, message to send to somebody. It, it alleviates that family from feeling responsible for what's going on and helps them realize that there's things that are being reinforced outside of, of whatever they're doing as a family member. So there's tools like that, like Lorraine mentioned communication tools. They talk about red lights and green lights and how to, um, um, you know, 
utilize cues from your loved one of when to talk to them. Um, for example, um, you know, I know when my son was using and he was in high school, if, let's say I was in his room and I found something that was upsetting to me um, for the sake of his privacy on here, I won't get into what that could have been, but something that clued me in that perhaps there was some use going on and something that scared me, caused me to be fearful. Um, so I would just sit there and wait all day long for him to get home from school, walk in that back door, and I was pouncing on him like a lion. I mean, it was, he couldn't get in the first word, and I was on top of that. Um, and so what I learned through craft is that um, communication is a much more layered process than just waiting for them to come home and pouncing. Um, it is um, being willing to take that step back and listening and watching for cues, and they, you know, red lights and green lights. Um, you know, if he walked in the door and threw his book down and, you know, Coach Jones is such a jerk and I'm not going back to football. That's not really the time for me to start that conversation. But, um, but if I come in and, and, and that conversation starts differently and he's like, mom, what you been up to today? You know, and what are we having for dinner or whatever? Then, you know, there's that, that might be a more of an invitation to have those kind of conversations. The craft is just top full with communication tools, um, just strategies to help us understand their behavior, actions to help us intervene in their behavior. And we try to teach those things to people um, as coaches. Thanks, Patty. Um, Molly, I was wondering if you could comment on the differences between using craft potentially to, to help, because um, the, the tools that are being described are part of community reinforcement and family training, um, as opposed to family therapy. Sure. Um, thanks, Pat, and thanks, Lorraine and, and Patty, for um, opening up this conversation in this rich way about parents' experiences themselves. I think um, one thing that, that is important in our work is to talk about this kind of continuum of family involvement and treatment. And one piece of good news is that there are evidence-based approaches all along that continuum of parent involvement. We can even think about psychoeducation, helping parents and families understand what addiction is and what evidence-based treatment for addiction look like, looks like, and then moving along that continuum and thinking about parent coaching, thinking about parent behavior change um, toward these goals of supporting the person, the family that's struggling with a substance use disorder and to entering treatment and increasing their own capacity for self-care. I think moving along that continuum is family therapy, right? If we imagine that maybe craft is the midpoint there on that continuum of, of family involvement. And one difference is that we would say is that rather than the, the client in a craft context being the, the parent or loved one or the concern serving another, in family therapy, we consider the client to be the family, the client to be the relationships that exist within that family. Um, and we know that family therapy for adolescent substance use has the strongest evidence base. Um, as effective as it is, we know it's widely underutilized, worsening a treatment gap that already exists. And so when we're talking about craft and family therapy, I think one helpful way, again, to, to think about that difference is who's the client here? Um, and if we're imagining that the client is the whole family, if we're imagining that everybody, maybe not for every session or for every therapeutic encounter or for every intervention, but that folks are together in the treatment context, then we're talking about family therapy. Thanks, Molly, I appreciate that. Um, so, so sometimes I think family members will say, I'm not the problem here, right? It's I need you to take my loved one and put them in a rehab for 30 days and they're gonna be fixed. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if anybody on the panel can comment on, on kind of that, that way of thinking and perhaps how, you, how to engage the whole family. I can start and speak to it. Okay. You know, I think one of the things that I think is super important uh, um, to recognize when we're talking about this experience of, hey, I'm not the problem, this person is, is as family therapists, we think about the context, right? And we think about the ecology. And 
folks that are struggling with a substance use problem in their families are in a context with a tremendous amount of stigma and shame and blame, right? Just as, as you were speaking about Lorraine. And I think one issue that emerges in this question about how do we engage family members more effectively in treatment is how do we contend with that stigma? And when we invite folks to participate, how are we managing that awareness that that invitation to participate is in this context of shame and blame, is in this context of past providers distributing shame and blame. And I think a, something that's really important to think about is how is increased involvement not just spreading blame around, right? We don't want an experience of being in treatment together to be this kind of hot potato of blame. I'm the problem, no, you're the problem, right? coming from a real authentic belief that every member of the family, parents, the person that's struggling with substance use, all have strengths and resiliencies that we can capitalize on. And that, it's very important, I think, for that belief on the provider end to be really sincere. You know, there's a family therapist um, that has a, a, a quote that has really been important in the training that we do that says, um, what we think is what we see and what we see is what we do. So if we have some belief system around people that use drugs are like this and the parents of people that use drugs or alcohol are like that, that informs how we view the clients that are coming into our office and that includes the interventions that we offer them. And so we're called as another family therapist, Ken Hardy talks about to be in the hope manufacturing business. How can we hold on to a hopeful frame again, with the belief that people have strengths and resiliencies that family therapy can expand and capitalize on and be a base from as we're aiming to support them in making kind of any positive change that may be available. Thanks, Molly. Um, Ken, anything you'd wanna to add to that? Just to pick up on what Molly said, and uh, I'll step back and, you know, uh, something just really, really, important and when we think just about being human beings and the power of relationships um, and not being isolated and having support scaffolding um, as we journey through life. Um, and unfortunately, just um, so much of what you see is that families are asked to be put on the sidelines um, and the resiliency that people bring and Molly touched on that resiliency is also in relationships. So why not, let's just think about how relationships can be helpful and supportive. Um, so working with families and families, those are the relationships people live their daily lives in. So how can we help strengthen them and give people hope and a compass for using them in a way that helps supports change as opposed to all the messaging that's out there about sidelining it and, and not. So um, I, want to keep that core element is we're talking about relationships and just leveraging that power. So the us and them kind of perspective, I just bring back and it's, it's really about helping people strengthen their relationships in a way that, that adds to their lives. Thanks, Ken. Um, one question though, I mean, uh, Lorraine and Patty have talked about um, using positive reinforcement and about having these um, very lovely, productive conversations where um, you know, you're trying to encourage someone toward healthier behaviors. But I've often heard from other families that um, they're not sure that this approach of using craft skills would be helpful. You know, like it'd be good for somebody, like you know, your kid's a teenager and they're smoking some weed, like it might be helpful for them. But if I've got somebody who has a very serious um, heroin use disorder or a meth use disorder, it probably won't work. So interested in your perspectives on, on that. Yeah, I've got a couple thoughts on that. Um, so, I mean, I've worked with an awful lot of families and their loved ones use is, you know, the, a lot of variability in what their story is and what they come to, um, to the conversation with. But the way I look at it is um, that before being introduced to craft, I kind of felt like there were, there were two options. I know in my home, this was certainly true. And it was kind of a, a hands-off, turn your head, hope it goes away, head in the sand 
um, kind of a, a, a minimal, like, um, be, not because you don't love them and you don't care, but because you don't know what to do. So, so you just kind of hope for the best and, and, and you're kind of operating from that standpoint, or, you know, you're going, you know, all in and, you know, hoping for this rock bottom and send them away, kick them out of the house. There just seemed to be a lot of extremes. And before I was introduced to craft, I didn't know that there was kind of this middle area um, that can be very effective with somebody who is perhaps using IV heroin um, or is um, maybe further advanced in their drug use. Because I don't care where you are in, in your use, um, having an open dialogue with the people that love you most is always important. It's always helpful. Um, I have many people I've, I'm friends with, I've worked with, whose children have been homeless, whose children have been, um, you know, very much at the depths of their use. Um, and I can't think of one example where having zero communication with them um, would be a good plan, that that would be something that would be helpful. But the problem is, is most parents don't know how to do that communication. We don't know what to do. Um, so the tools of craft kind of give us a roadmap to do that. They kind of give us um, some, some strategies to use to help keep those lines of communication open. Um, and obviously, if something is happening in someone's home that's dangerous or, you know, you do have to sometimes make those kinds of hard decisions, but that's not, those are the outliers. Those aren't the day-to-day -day types of situations. Um, so I think craft is very applicable to all situations, all different scenarios that might be happening. Um, and, and addiction is a real continuum, you know, I mean, people are at different places and different times. So these are skills that you could use throughout the process of somebody um, who might be actively using, whether they're um, in, a, in a very, um, you know, a time that is, that is more significant than others in terms of the severity of their use. Um, but the tools are, are useful, I think, for, for anybody at any time. Thanks, Patty. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Sure. Um, I agree with Patty. I really believe that these tools um, are um, broad enough that at any point in recovery, sobriety, those tools can be leveraged. Um, I also um, agree that most importantly, these tools will really help families. Families are sitting around at their kitchen table. They don't know what to do. They're taking a little piece of this and a little piece of that. And based on their experiences, they're trying to come up with a plan that ends up being so eclectic and, and such a mess that, you know, you really don't get any, any, you know, you don't make any progress. So it helps the fam, the person in recovery, but most importantly, it helps that person support group, which is the family. I, mean, I remember in my personal situation, my parents were fearful to speak to my twin brother. For some reason, they thought by osmosis that I had the power, that we were one brain, yes, we were born at the same time, that I can convince him and talk him out of his addiction. Obviously, it didn't work because he's not alive today. Had we had craft, I would not have been left alone running around to different groups and different meetings and different step programs out of my you know, neighborhood because I didn't want anybody to know who I was because of the shame and stigma. I could have brought my family together. You know, I have very smart strategic family to figure out, and he was a heavy duty user um, together so that my mom didn't suffer and my father didn't suffer and we could have really it minimally, maybe we could have gotten him in, into um, recovery. You know, we could have gotten him in, you know, he could have gotten, he could be in a, a program today instead of being in a grave. I'm going to add one last thing to that, Pat, too. And there, there's one of the tools in craft that I think is just incredible. Um, just, a, I mean, it's just a concept, but it, it was certainly not a concept that really occurred to us when my son was um, so heavily using. And that was just simply the concept of um, like two parents getting on the same page. Um, I wish that somebody had brought that to me. It seems so simple now when I hear it. I'm like, how did we not think of that? But um, the whole time that my son was using, I was fighting with my husband because what, you know, on any given day, one of us wants to do it one way, one wants to do it the other. I want to come down hard. He wants to go easy or vice versa. 
Um, and we spent such unproductive time, instead of sitting down and saying, you know, what do we need, before we can help him, we've got we to gotta figure this out between us. Um, those are the kinds of things that craft helps you to navigate. Um, and that to be, going back to your original question, Pat, that, that, those are tools you could use no matter who the, the person is that's using and where they are, whether it's that teenager who's just smoking pot on the weekend or that, you know, very, very um, severe case um, of addiction. Um, those are still important and valuable tools. Thanks, Patty. So I'm going to throw one question out to Ken, and then there are a couple on the um, chat that I want to elevate to the group. So um, if you haven't been looking at chat, please take a look because some of the resources are being posted there. Um, a couple of people from Partnership uh, to End Addiction are, are supplying answers as we go. So I greatly appreciate that. But um, so Ken, this one is relative to an intervention, right? So everybody's probably seen the classic intervention on television if they haven't already participated in one or what have you. Is there room for an intervention in, and um, can craft be married to an intervention? Is it in lieu of an intervention? Or what, what would you say to somebody? Because um, this, some families will say, this sounds all really nice, like you're being super nice to somebody and, you know, but I need, you know, to, to give them an ultimatum. I need to confront them because it's just been going nowhere. So what would you say? These softballs, huh? <laughs> 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 um, it's a great question. I, I, the, the way I'll answer that today, um, and it's important, is I, I always kind of operate from one size doesn't fit all. So I am very leery to say there's only one approach to helping. And there are all different experiences that families have that have been helpful. When To answer that particular question, I'll just look at some of the research that um, interventions are on a continuum, so I can't speak to the quality or the coaching that each particular family gets from working with an interventionist. I am sure there's a lot of variability in that. When Kraft was initially looked at in a study, um, what they wanted to compare the outcomes with was a particular intervention from the Johnson Institute. Um, and it was actually developed to be a very thoughtful, planned way, working with a counselor to script a session where family members could sit down with their loved one and say, this is how your behavior is affecting us. And here are our kind of, these are our limits. And this is our strong, basically, stance that you need treatment. Um, and, and the findings were interesting. Um, if done in a very supportive, caring way where families rallying around an individual, and these are some of the communication strategies. I know Molly looks at common denominators and treatment and, you know, what are the ingredients in effective communication? The Johnson Institute was helpful. The downside to that, which is only 30% of the families got to the point where they could sit down and have that conversation. So the difference between that versus craft where 60 to, well, it was probably high, around 70% on average of the families were able to help their loved ones seek help. It just pointed to the fact that craft seemed to be more digestible for families and able to roll out in the context of their values and their family system, where the intervention approach was a heavier lift and it doesn't always sit well with families or resonate with the way they want to do this. Um, so to have options is key. Uh, if you're a family member saying the only option you have is to do an intervention, that can be really a tough lift if that's not resonating with the way you want to be there for your loved one. Um, so Kraft um, offers other effective ways of trying to be helpful and supportive um, in, in helping guide their loved one to seek help. Thanks. Molly, did you want to, you were nodding your head um, in, in tacit agreement, I think. Um, did you want to add anything to that or, or are we good? I think that's well said. And so definitely not in agreement. You, the only piece that I would just want to reinforce, speaking of craft principles, I guess, is that um, the lens of effectiveness, I think is really important to pay attention to, right? Like Pat, you were naming this thing around, is this too nice, quote unquote, is this urgent? Am I responsive to the urgency enough? And I guess 
in my experience working with families and in thinking through some of these models, a framework about what works is a lens that I, my hope is, is that's helpful. And moving us away from, am I being um, underreactive, overreactive? Am I being too nice? Am I being too mean? How can we say to ourselves, is this effective? What are more effective ways that I might be able to approach this? When have I been most effective in the past? Okay, thank you. Um, Lorraine and Patty, I'm going to throw this question to you. It's, it's from chat and it's talking about how do we intersect with um, Al-Anon or Naranon or Families Anonymous or some of the other support group programs. Lorraine, you want to grab that one? Um, I would say that um, if it's, I would see a dual relationship, I mean, with both understand what Al-Anon and um, what these other programs have to offer, really understand their ideology. Um, and then I would add craft to that as well. I mean, talk about where they're at in their recovery, um, talk about the information you're getting from them, stay involved. And then I would add craft as well. I wouldn't, if it's working, again, this is, no two families are alike, no one size fits all. And it's really important to really assess your loved one's um, journey in the recovery and where they're at. If it seems to be working, definitely the two can work together. The two can help you communicate um, and to really build a support system and a communication system within the family, between individuals, to really bring your loved one um, into recovery, into sobriety, and to, um, to help them through their, um, through their disease and the day-to-day the -day, um, challenges that they have. So I've seen both work in tandem and work efficiently and effectively. Um, again, there can be some, in, you know, there can be some touch points where things contradict each other, you know, the tough love versus the love, the hitting the bottom versus, um, versus, you know, loving somebody through recovery. My philosophy, my belief is to love someone through, um, and you know your child, you know your loved one, um, and to love them through, and it's, and it's possible, it's effective. You know, they're a basic, my belief system is they're a basic human rights that everyone deserves. And that is, you know, a roof over their head, food, um, love, support, you know, health, education. And those, I, you know, those ideals should be kept in place in, in a family setting. And if another program is depriving them of that, you may want to assess that and step away from that. So it's all about bringing the best of the best, you know, to your family and um, the loved one that it's, that's in recovery. I would agree with that too. And the only thing I would add to it is, is um, you know, I mean, you just pretty much said exactly what I would have said there, Lorraine. I think that, um, you know, connection is just really important for people and not having to do this alone. Um, and I think going out into your community and finding um, whether it's Families Anonymous or, or NAR, you know, I I any of the programs, Al-Anon, NARNON, any of the programs, Smart Recovery, um, there's a lot, like in our community here in Huntsville, there's just, there's been um, faith-based programs that are out there for families, but finding those connections, finding what works for you, and this is what I always tell a family when they come to me and like, you know, where do I go, what do I do, I'm like, what if this was your loved one and they had cancer? What if this was your child and they had cancer? Would you not go out and research everything? Go out and find all the options. Go find out everything. I know as a mother, if I, if I had a diagnosis like that, I'd be out there, you know, just researching until my until I couldn't, you know, hold my eyes open anymore. So go do that. Go out there and see, you know, find what connects to you, what resonates to you. But what I love about craft is it's a it's an alternative that just hasn't really been as available um, as it is now. And I think, um, you know, having that as an alternative um, and finding also in a lot of those groups that are out there, they're very dependent on the people that are in the group. Um, they can vary dramatically, um, even though they might have a specific message, the, the way that message is delivered um, is very much based on the individual uh, individuals attending that, just like any group you go to. So I always encourage people, go out there and, and see it all, learn it all, listen and do what works for you, what, what makes sense for you and your family. 
um, I, I'm with Lorraine for me and my family, the, the message of craft and how it um, um, presents uh, in terms of helping my loved one is, is certainly what works for me. And I'd like to add one more thing to that. It's that craft does give you those tools to assess the progress of your loved ones regardless of what program that they might be attending or whatever adjunct um, or, you know, um, dual um, modalities or other um, programs that there's the set of tools and the assessment tools and to be able to monitor your child. Um, Craft has those tools in place. So, um, and again, it's really, the structure is amazing because not only is it built to help your loved one in recovery, the amazing strength that it brings to us as individuals, the tools it brings to us as individuals to have overcome fear and of, of having a dialogue, overcome fear of not knowing who our child, to start a conversation, to know when to have those conversations and when to engage. So even if they are attending an Al-Anon, um, an, Al- an Al-Anon, a faith space, we can still, it's the beauty of craft is that you could just bring it into those programs as well and to eat, strengthen whatever they're doing because we can figure out if it's working or not and really layer it. I think, Patty, you mentioned layered. You can layer this upon whatever um, form or source of recovery that they're in. It works beautifully. Thanks both Patty and Lorraine. Um, Just as a um, a point of information, the um, Partnership to End Addiction does offer some online support groups for families and in the support groups, part of it's a process group, just to talk about you know, what's going on in your life and what kind of difficulties are you running into. The other part of it is topic-based, topic-driven. And so the topic might be on, how do I set limits with my child? How do I um, react when my child's pushing my buttons? How do I set limits that I can follow through on, actually communicate to my child and follow through on? How do I allow natural consequences to occur? Um, so a, a, a very wide um, array of topics that can be really helpful for families. Um, and I also noticed um, Tom Jackson noted that Smart um, Recovery for Friends and Family is also based on craft, so another resource for people that are out there. Um, I know Ken won't shamelessly plug the book that um, his organization has written, but I will for him. <laughs> um, it's called Beyond Addiction. Uh, by Drs. Jeffrey Foote, Nicole Kasanke, and Carrie Wilkins. Um, I personally, I have a private practice. Um, I uh, recommend it to all my families because I think it's just a really good primer on what addiction is and um, how families can be involved in a positive way. Um, so um, that's there. And the, the Parent 20 Minute Guide, which has been mentioned in chat, There's also a partner 20 minute guide and both of those are companion documents um, that that work with the Beyond Addiction book. Um, um, Another question that came up in chat was about um, the topic of enabling. So I was talking to a family not too long ago. Um, Their daughter had been to residential treatment. She came out, um, she wanted to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Um, She has a young daughter, three years old and wanted one of her family members to watch the daughter so she could go to the AA meeting. And they said, not gonna do it, that's enabling. So I'm wondering if anyone on the panel would like to jump in and talk about you know, what is enabling, um, good, bad, or indifferent, let's, let's, uh, let's have some discussion. Patty, you wanna go? I actually think Ken, Ken might be a good one on this one because I've heard Ken have this conversation. I'll type that oh, in. <laughs> I'll, 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 I know there's a lot of different uh, perspectives on this. I'll just say I try to repurpose the word. I'm a father of two boys, um, and I always say stepping into the world of parenting, you're never given a crystal ball or a blueprint, and you usually are asked to get more instruction to get your driver's license than to uh, take your child home. Um, so with all the uncertainty around that, I like to think I want to be an enabler. And I say that with the asterisk next to that. I want to enable my kids to have a rewarding, connected life and to thrive and develop 
a life that they can own and feel is rewarding. And I would love to help build the scaffolding and support and guidance that enable them to experience that. The key here is you just have to be careful about what you want to enable. And to me, that's the question. As a parent, as supporting someone, what things would you like to enable? And what things would you like to be careful about when you think about support? So I, I say that and try to repurpose that because often the term is used that anything you do to support your loved one who is struggling is bad. And I'm not saying everybody uses that way, but the shame and the stigma that often travels with that, that if, again, back to that garden, if I wanna grow a beautiful garden, I do need to be careful about how I respond to things I don't wanna grow, weeds. But I also need to be aware of the things I have to continue to support to allow the flowers I want to continue to grow. Supporting those flowers is not enabling. Well, it is, it's enabling the flowers to grow, but it's different than supporting the weeds that I don't want to. So I say enabling is just, let's be more refined about how we use that. What are the behaviors you want to support? And what are the behaviors that you'd like to be more careful about to not support? And to me, that's the big distinction and not just an overarching term of that word. I think that um, I, I love the way that Ken explains that. I, I think it's just a really um, useful way of taking a word that is maybe overused sometimes in our um, field here. Um, I think, you know, to me, the thing when I hear that word, sometimes I get a little prickly because I, a lot of times I hear it used like, uh, oh, well, you're just an enabler um, in kind of in a very derogatory way. And I do think that, um, you know, just like Ken said, you know, if it's if you're using it to encourage a behavior that you don't want to see continue, continue, then it's a problem. And um, but it's I, I think getting away from labels like calling people an enabler um, or you're a codependent or you're um, I don't think those things are really useful. Um, in and. I think that there's better ways to approach things than, than using those kind of terms in that manner. So we also have a, thanks Patty, we also have a question about um, being called a rescuer. So, um, you know, to me that smacks of potentially allowing natural consequences. Molly, do you want to talk about, about being a rescuer and how, um, how maybe, allowing natural consequences can be helpful or, or in some cases perhaps too dangerous? Sure, I think it's definitely a piece of what um, Patty and Ken, you were speaking to. I'm appreciative of that part of the conversation because I think before you all started speaking, I kind of am, was of the belief that the, the term was maybe beyond reform, but this is an in inspiration to me to say <laughs> perhaps we can reclaim the, the word, because I do feel that, um, uh, yeah, oftentimes the, it comes from a pathologizing place. Um, I think that it's interesting about that word rescuing. Yeah, I, I guess I have the same, the same thoughts come up for me, um, Pat, about um, does, does it mean not allowing natural consequences? Does it mean inadvertently contributing to some pattern continuing? And I think the most important thing particularly again in this, in this uh, context of, of wanting to reduce stigma, is how are we in a collaborative relationship with folks like about the words that we're using to describe their experiences. If folks want to identify as like, as okay, so, so I have found myself rescuing, um, just as it's imperative for me not to pathologize and put a label on somebody that again, I think is pejorative, maybe say like, quote unquote, like enabling, it's also imperative for me to co-create with folks I'm working with the language that they want to use to describe their experience and in their families. And so if the idea of, I, I don't want to rescue anymore, if that has resonance for somebody, then let's go with that, you know? Um, how can I support you in 
minimizing some of those rescuing behaviors? How can I support you in maximizing whatever the opposite would look like, right? Or rescuing in different ways towards your point, Ken. Um, and so again, rather than imagining that there are some objective definitions for these words, again, that are often, again, as you're saying, Patty, used in very pejorative ways, which also I think, I just wanna say briefly, part of the thing that gets in the way of welcoming family involvement, I do think is a culture, particularly kind of white American culture, that really values independence and autonomy and separation. And that's the whole part of what it means to become an adult is to separate and move away. Rather than again, imagining that there are healing power, there is healing power in relationships. And um, if we don't pathologize relationships, do we end up then pathologizing these kinds of loving behaviors that then we end up labeling as enabling or codependency later? So if we can re reform some of the ways we think about relationships in general, is there a trickle down approach to then some of these other behaviors we're talking about? Thanks, Molly. Uh, and I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, when I talk to parents about, you know, not rescuing, if as the case may be, or if there's a, um, an ability for their child to have an experience where they, they let, you know, the world teach them that their actions have consequences, and it feels within the, the family's level of comfort um, that, you know, that they can allow that and still put their head down on a pillow at night, then I'm like good with it. And, and otherwise it's like, okay, you got to pass on this. You don't have to do that. So, um, so we, we have um, a couple minutes left. Um, and so there was one other question about codependency is another word. Um, you know, it, it, to me, a lot of these words, um, whether it's um, enabling codependency, um, uh, rescuing and so forth, um, they do carry a lot of, of baggage with them sometimes um, and, and can be demeaning. Um, so it just, um, just as, you know, uh, we're trying to change language overall, so it's not addict or alcoholic, it's someone with an alcohol use disorder or someone with problematic drinking or something like that. I think it's, it's an opportunity for us to think about what language do we want to use um, to teach the rest of the world, right? How, how to speak with families who are struggling with this issue. So, um, uh, any any um, parting thoughts from our, our panelists um, that you you know something we haven't covered that you would like to make sure that the um, participants um, understand or hear? I've got Ready? one thing I do. Um, there is to me one of the overarching concepts of craft, and I'll say this really quick: is self care is taking that moment to um, recognize that this is really hard and this is really stressful and that you need to be um, keeping yourself as healthy as you can during this process. And craft really emphasizes that, focuses on, on that, um, um, you know, just that the value of you being um, the best place you can be and as healthy as you can be from all different perspectives. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we put that in there, that I, to me, I think that's one of the overarching elements of craft is that it's all based on the fact that the family has to be well and healthy um, and in a good place for them to be able to do a lot of the tools that come with craft. So Patty, um, what, would you, what would you say to a family though, who says, you know, I'm only as happy as my least happy child? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know what I always talk about, you know, like if your child were to go away to treatment and, you know, you have two or three months while they're gone, you know, well, in today's world, you have 14 days while they're gone, um, you know, to kind of rework what is it going to look like when they come home? What, what's going to be attractive for them to come home to? A family that is angry and frustrated and disappointed and bitter and yelling at each other and, and, and or is it going to be a home that, um, has done some work and has educated themselves and has taken walks and has had a few nice dinners out and, and cleaned out some closets and, and just made time and space for being in a healthy place. What's going to give your loved one the best, op the op the best opportunity for success when they return home, um, if that's what they do? And, um, you know, to me, that makes it really clear. You know, it's, 
it's it's just really really important to take that time out to make sure because you're you're doing it for you but you're really really doing it for them as well.